I am very pleased to announce a C2C alum, Ardeth Albi, is CEO of Marketing Interactions, and she's going to be joined in a little bit by Kirsten, Kirsten Jepson, Senior Director of Market Strategy at Sykes Enterprises, and uh, they'll be talking about using content marketing at scale across the enterprise. Welcome, Ardeth Albi. Thanks, Carol. Thank you. Okay, my job is to keep you awake after lunch. <laughs> so we don't have very long, so I'm going to jump right in. And it occurs to me that before I can talk to you guys about using content at scale, that first we need to define what scale means. And quite often, the way scale is interpreted is more, right? More volume, a higher quantity of content. We need more stuff. And I'd like you to reconsider that that's really not what scale is all about. Scale is about breadth and depth. And when we talk about breadth and depth, I'm talking about topic coverage, I'm talking about the way you focus your expertise and the way you showcase and share it, and really how you portray the problem to solution journey for your prospects and customers. And so what we really want to talk about, and I wrote a whole book about this called Digital Relevance, and there are actually a few copies left available over in the Folos booth for anybody who wants to go get them. But what, I, what you really need to think about is the continuum experience. So short one-off campaigns are not enough to help you scale. The reason simply is because you just have to keep creating more of them. And they don't cover a broad enough period of time in order to engage your prospects and have them move through their decisioning process to decide to change. And so we have to start really thinking about addressing scale as what it takes to address the continuum of the buying process, okay? So from beginning to end, one continuous story focused on your expertise, okay? And in order to do that, of course, you need to be able to tell a really good story. However, in order to tell a really good story, a story that builds the vision of what's possible for your buyers, you really need personas. Anybody who knows me knows that that's gonna come out of my mouth <laughs> at some point. Um, and the reason you need personas is because imagine sitting down and saying, okay, I'm gonna write a story, but you don't know who you're writing it for or who you're telling it to. It's kinda hard to write a story that's going to engage anybody if you don't know who your buyers are. So it's really key that we think about how are we going to build these engaging stories that compel people to take action with us that transitions them from where they're sitting at right now to a purposeful intent to change. And without that, you're not going to sell them anything. And so marketing at scale, in order to scale it, needs to be complete as a story. It needs to be persona focused, and it needs to be transitional. It needs to help people gain momentum and move from where they are now to where they could be in the future. Now, Forrester Research finds that 74% of the time, the vendor who sets the vision first, that the prospect can relate to, the buyer can relate to, that makes sense for them, that's relevant, is the one who gets a deal. And the other reason I want you to think about scale not as volume is because research, excuse me, research shows that we create more and more content every year. But what happens is engagement is declining by a lot. So Track Maven does these studies if you want to go look them up. The other thing that Forrester finds is when they talk to executive buyers is that 62% of buyers say that vendor content is useless. Well, if that's true, creating more of it is not going to help. So we need to really think about how are we going to create this, the stories that scale. And we're going to talk about how to do this. But first, I want to really point out this idea of what happens when you think about scale as volume. This scenario is typical for a lot of my clients. They have three to five personas. They may work in four or five industry verticals. And let's say they need to touch their prospects once a month. Let's say we're creating a nurture program. Well, if you do the math, 
you end up with 240 content assets just to touch your prospects one time a month for a year. That's 20 content assets a month. But here's the, the other issue with that. When content marketing came along, it's not like they cleared your plate and said, okay, you're just only going to do content marketing from now on. No, this was an add-on. So a lot of us have a lot of other things we have to do, events, you know, other types of, of content uh, advertising, display advertising, uh, SEO, PPC, all kinds of different things that we're doing, writing the blog, doing social media. There are a lot of different things that you have to do, so it's not just, say, this one project, right? It's not just these content touches. And so if you look at the volume as the driver of scale, what you have is this. And we don't need this. <laughs> Nobody in here wants this, right? I figured after lunch it was appropriate to keep you guys awake. So what we need to do is think about how do we reduce volume in a way that's meaningful, right? How do we increase value? And so what I want you to think about is the way that you can actually create less content, get more use out of it, which allows you to scale and reach more people with less ever effort but with better results. So one of the things you want to do in order to uh, reduce volume is identify commonalities. And when I'm talking about commonalities, I'm referencing back to personas. And so a persona really a strong persona is built around the commonalities that you can decipher across a target segment. So the more commonalities that you can address, the wider swath of buyers within that target market you're going to be able to engage. If you focus only on the unique things that maybe only a few of them have, that's who you're going to get. So personas well done are focused on commonalities. So when you have personas as a foundation, and then you look at topics for content and the story you're trying to develop, and you look across your personas, and you say, okay, what are the commonalities, right? What transitions? Because quite often, the same information is needed by different personas, only presented in a different context, right? And so if we start thinking about in what way is information acceptable to each of our personas based on this topic, we can start seeing ways that we can create less content but be able to spin it in more directions. So in a way, scaling content across the enterprise is about repurposing, creating less original content but more versions of it in ways that are truly relevant to your buyers. So one of the things <clears throat> that we work on um, is pivot plans. And we've done quite a bit of this at Sykes in, in quite a number of different ways. And so when you think of a pivot plan, you have to put something in the, per, in the center and to pivot around, and usually that's personas for us. And we say, okay, at Sykes we have, for each division, four different personas. So we'll say, okay, we want to talk about this topic. And as we look at the topic and we look across the personas for a vertical industry, what are the commonalities? What of, will the same information be useful to more than one persona? And then if we look at spinning it for a different industry, what will need to change? You know, there's different ways of speaking, different phrases used across industries, different importance placed in different areas. So we need to know those things as well. <clears throat> and then the other thing, just to keep it really simple, is what's a relevant illustration of the topic in play, so a use case. Now everybody gets kind of tied up about use cases, and we don't need to be. What we need to think about is that we need to illustrate what would this look like in real life. So anecdotal is fine. So here's an example of persona pivots that we used at Sykes, and this is for the technology sector. And the example at the top is for the contact center operations person. And the example at the bottom is for the chief procurement officer. If you go out on the blog and search for these titles, you'll find both of these. You'll see that the body copy is exactly the same. What changed was the introduction and the conclusion, because both of these personas need this information and can use it. And so we figured out how to spin it. This is one of the simplest ways to spin things. 
And because the titles are different, the introduction and the close are different, as well as the categories and tags and keywords that we focused on for each, you know, we're, we're able to have this searched and found by our personas using those relevant terms. The other type of pivot is an industry pivot, and this is an example we did recently, and they have a great data analytics um, group at Sykes, and what we found was there were five universal truths that were evident across the technology sector that were causing problems with customer service. And so we wrote a white paper about that, and then Kirsten, who works, is in charge of the financial services uh, sector, said, you know, we probably have the same thing there. And so we had the analytics team look, and sure enough, there were four universal truths. Two of them were the same as the tech. So we could spin those and repurpose them and then just write new content for the new two. So we ended up with two white papers with very little additional effort. Um, so now if we revisit the math, four personas, we're gonna pivot them in different ways to address the industry. 12 touches a year, now you're down to 48 original content assets that you need for the year. Quite different than 240, but if you think about it with all the spins, you'll end up with 240 assets. It's a different level of work but you achieve greater scale with less effort, which allows you time to add more value, either add more personas and more tracks, add more deep level content like webinars, white papers, what have you, and then look at your white paper as a multiplier, right? So if you address a problem in a white paper and let's say you address how the problem would impact each of your personas, then you can pull out each part for each persona and turn it into a blog post or an article or a nurture touch or something else. So what we need to start thinking about is every time we create content, how can we multiply it to reach higher scale? So one of the things that came out earlier, or I guess it was the end of last year, was this thing about ideas. And Capos did this research, and what they found was <clears throat> that marketers are saying they need 67 ideas per quarter in order to create enough content. Think about that. That's a lot of ideas. They say a constant stream of ideas is necessary for them to create content. Most of them don't have a good way of doing this. So I'm going to give you the good way of doing this. Personas. <laughs> and so what the, the deal is, is if you have personas, you have infinite idea generation. And so what I propose in this example is a simple exercise of saying, pick a problem, right? Figure out how it applies across your persona slate. In this case, we picked cost management. And you can see personas, we have the call center operations manager, interested in first call resolution. Why? Because it reduces the number of calls the agents have to deal with. Customers are happier. If agents are spending less time on calls, that's less money that we're spending. And so that resonates with him. By the same token, the customer experience persona is worried about how do we use retention as a source of growth, right? Well, if we can resolve uh, issues faster and better, and if we can use the contact center agent who's providing support as a vehicle for cross and upsell, so turning them into a revenue generator, then we can have retention as growth. By the same token, the line of business manager says, I need more of my products in the hands of customers. By the same, in the same way, a contact center agent can upsell during support, the line of business manager is happy. So if you think about this and you really brainstorm it out, you've got uh, three unique approaches. One idea about cost management, you do all your research and writing at the same time, spin it with these three focuses for what's most relevant to the persona, and very simply have three articles that can be used standalone or could also be combined into a paper about cost management in the contact center. So it's really critical to think about when you're generating ideas, it's not just about, okay, I gotta post a blog post, right? I need to write a blog post. What's an idea? Give me something I can write about that anybody will care about which results in random acts of content. Random acts of content don't build that story across the entirety of the continuum. 
right? So you're not going to be motivating people to actually change anything. And you have to make that happen in order to convert engaged prospects into buyers, right? And so <clears throat> it's really critical that we start looking at how do we do this as a strategic process, an integrated process where all the pieces work together to make it less effort for us to achieve more, but not just to achieve scale as kind of a further reach thing, but to achieve scale in performance. So the tighter we keep our stories and the better we apply them to what our personas need and the better we hook them together and as well as when you're addressing personas in this kind of an instance, you're also facilitating conversations they need to have with each other, right? Because they're the consensus team. They're gonna go talk to each other. So why is it that we as marketers create this siloed track for one persona and this track for another persona and then we've got this track over here for the third one when instead we should be looking at where do the topics overlap? Where do they need to have conversations and how do we facilitate that? And if we create our content programs in a thoughtful way, we can start helping them do this, which the end result is going to be they get in more conversations with your salespeople. So in addition to generating ideas and uh, lessening the effort and that kind of thing, Kirsten is now gonna come up and talk to you about a behind the scenes look at what she goes through to help um, harness her subject matter experts for information, where she finds ideas, and how she actually brings those to bear on creating more scale for the content marketing initiatives we produce there. Welcome to Kirsten. Thanks for that great setup, Ardith. How does this really happen in practice? That's what I'd like to share with you today. The reality is that for me, I start with industry issues. I spend a lot of time figuring out on this hand, what are the industry issues? And then on this hand, what exactly does Sykes do to solve those issues for our clients. So starting with the business issues and then combining that with what we can do, that's where the real valuable content actually lies. That's the true, the true stuff that we wanna get out to our prospects and our buyers. And the way that we do this is by creating a map. So I work with my colleagues, my peers, and we regularly talk about what sort of messages will work within our organization. Digital support channels, the examples of this are the digital support channels, customer experience and innovation. Those hold true across all of our verticals. Underneath that, I have industry messages that I know will work in my industries. If the folks that I work with know what my industry messages are, that gives us the ability to look across all of our different segments and say, gosh, we really have this cost topic that keeps coming up. Let's go ahead and figure out how we can take advantage of that knowledge and create content around that topic because that's the most valuable topic that we've got. It, it keeps showing up. We need to solve for that. So we spend a lot of time planning. This is the planning portion of what we do, discussing it and figuring out how to really zero in on those topics. Ardith mentioned ideas. I have a really hard time figuring out how to have fewer ideas. One way that I do that is by busting in on a lot of meetings. How many in this room actually have sales meetings as part of what their organizations do? Everybody has to have sales meetings. How many people go to those sales meetings as marketers? Eh, 25, 30%, I would say. You need to get invited to these meetings, whether it's sales, operations, that's where con content opportunities lay. They're getting out on the street at industry conferences. One thing that I find really interesting when I go to my, say, financial services or healthcare conferences, I go to those and there are the people working at the booth, like myself, they're still in the exhibit hall when industry issues are being talked about. You gotta get out of the hall, go to, go to the meetings, go to the sessions, see what the industry issues are. 
but other sources for ideas. I'm going to give you a couple of examples of other opportunities. Uh, our product is people. So our people are actually working at sites. They're not working at the ivory tower where I am. So that means that I need to get out of my tower, and it literally is a tower, by the way, our corporate office, so I get to say that. It's kind of fun. I go to Manila. I go to Costa Rica. I go where the real work is actually happening. And in this case, I knew that the site director was doing a lot of really cool stuff at this site, at this particular site in Manila. Her name is Cherry. You can see her name here. And she has spent a lot of time figuring out how to hire English-speaking English -speaking offshore contact center agents to be effective in the contact center environment. She's also spent a lot of time in working in um, keeping them developed and entrenched. She is very proud of her work. So the what's in it for her, the WIFM for her, is really the, pr the pride that she has in what she does and the ego that she's got. Well, I'm going to play on that. So when I got back, Ardith and I did a great interview with her, and she very proudly told us everything we needed to know to create white papers. That's not hard. That's something that made her feel good. And she, got, she actually got promoted, not just because of the white paper, but I'm sure that that visibility, that brand building was an important part of that. Another way we do this is by multiplying what our SMEs bring to the table. I'm sure a lot of you recall last year that there was a big target breach, or two years ago now there was a big target breach. A lot of our clients were really nervous about that. They were afraid about what that meant in their contact centers. So we had to address that as a company, and we immediately got on that. I got our security guy on the phone. We did more interviews. We created three articles that we were able to very quickly and successfully uh, put out to our clients and our existing, uh, our clients and our prospects, and got great reviews, put some comfort in the place of, you know, where there was fears before. And so from one phone interview, we were able to get a succession of articles that we were able to use. And this is really timeless content. I still use this today. Security is not a concern that goes away in the financial services and healthcare industries. All right, you get one article, you have one interview, how do you keep them intrigued? I touched on this a little bit earlier. It's really about with him. Woohoo, rah rah. I send every article to the bylines boss. I make sure that it gets posted on the website. I remind them to put it on their own LinkedIn profile. I get their peers to like it out on LinkedIn. I make sure to do everything I can to get whoever the contributor was visit contributor was to the content visibility within the organization and outside of the organization, because at the end of the day, that helps sites. It sets us up as experts to have experts. That's what the whole concept is. We have got, across our company, um, three people who are primarily developing content. And it was pretty tricky for us to keep track of what was out there. And we looked at a number of different tools that enabled this. We've been doing this for four or five years now, so we've got a lot of older content that we needed to update to. And yes, we could have utilized one of those tools, but the reality is our salespeople, our relationship development managers, and so on, they're really more comfortable working in tools that they already are used to, and in this case, that's SharePoint. So we loaded our content marketing library, we're in the process of doing this, into SharePoint so they can really easily find co uh, content that they might want to share out with either their clients. Uh, it also feeds our RFP process, <clears throat> uh, newsletters, anything that we want to develop. And also my peers can access this and take a look at what I have and they can see what 
They can see what I have, I can see what they have. So it's a real uh, open way of seeing what sort of content is available so we can create the spins and the extensions that Ardeth was talking about. On that note, Q&A. Yes, we have a uh, little more than five minutes for Q&A. So I tell you, when they tell us to compress it to 30, we really went after that. <laughs> so anybody have any questions for either one of us? Yes, sir. Um, uh, that's a good question. It's hard to believe in this day and age that people still don't want to know their customers better. Um, the problem is they think they know them. They've made assumptions about it. They think that they are a good barometer of what their prospects and customers are going to like. I've sat in many a meeting where a marketer will say, well, I don't like that topic, so we're not writing about it when they are not the client or the customer. Um, I've done it a couple of different ways. We've done, I've worked with clients to kind of do stealth persona projects. Um, in one instance, we actually turned the marketer's boss into a persona and did a kind of, I hate to say it this way, but water drip torture nurture program on the boss and really made the content so relevant to what he cares about that even he was impressed with what it was and he said, okay, let's do one persona as a pilot. Um, but the stealth programs we've run have helped, but also I ask, I get calls all the time from companies who say, you know, we've got this much budget, we'd really rather apply it to content than we would to personas, right? Because we want stuff we can push out the door right now. And so I start asking them questions, great. So tell me about your target market, right? You don't have personas, so who are we creating the content strategy for? Why are they gonna care about it? Really, how do you know? Have you proven this? How is your content performing now? You want to increase performance? How are you going to do that? And as a consultant, I can get away with asking these kinds of questions and pushing hard because I'm not afraid they're going to fire me. Do you know what I mean? Whereas a marketer in-house would have a hard time asking those kinds of questions. But if you really push and say, well, how do you know what you spend all this money on is going to create content that moves the needle, right? Because a lot of marketers are now responsible for revenue. You know, if you really get them to think about that, then propose a pilot. You know, sometimes I've even proposed half a persona just to develop enough that I could show them the difference in the content we create with that knowledge versus the content they've always created without it. That was the suggestion I was going to make, too. So if you create a series using uh, different personas, then you can really see the difference in the angle. And if you talk to even the people in your organization, own organization that might have the same role, say IT, for example, and ask them to read something versus somebody who's a line of business owner, they don't, they don't That's cross over idea. too much. So create it and show the difference. If it's around cost management, which was the um, topic that we highlighted here, huge difference. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yes. We put our content up on our website as sort of our primary place, but we are directing through email campaigns. So when we do an email campaign, it's directed to the website. Um, most of the other channels that we have are less mature, so we haven't seen a lot of duplication. Is that what you mean? Candice, are you asking about content hubs? Yeah. They don't have content hubs per se right now. We haven't gotten to that yet. But they have the facility to do it because of the way we tagged the content and the keywords we used. 
And because of the, the vertical and persona orientations, we could very easily create content hubs. We just haven't done that yet. So even though we've been doing content marketing for a number of years, we've been focusing on nurture programs for a large part, but also building up the blog and the content library and really making Sykes a standout in, as an expert in their space with helpful content. So we're gonna get to more different kinds of uses and displays in the future. Is that accurate? I think, yeah. I think so, yeah. I didn't show the entire view of the content library because it's longer than that and there's some of it that's hidden behind the scenes. And we do have all of our keywords and so on identified so we can link it together and we would be able to create a content hub if we wanted to go that direction. Um, our, our sales cycle is really long and some of our uh, buyers haven't been or haven't looked as interested in some other channels, so that's why we've stayed focused on that. But we do always ask our question, is this right and is this enough? So we aren't ignoring it, we're choosing to go this route. All right, everybody, we are out of time. Thank you so very much. Have a great conference.